This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. Good evening, everyone. I'm very, very happy to be here. First time in Ashland. Uh, you'll have it, excuse me, I think I'm coming up with a cold, but thanks to Echinacea, it's taking care of it. Um, <coughs> I want to thank uh, Jordan and Abby and the uh, Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library for inviting me this evening. We met back in June. It was in Portland during a lecture. Another lecture I will give tomorrow, incidentally, in Portland. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have heard of the Rallying Movement before? Was it through the news, uh, the announcement of the clone baby? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and not before? Not heard of it. You've heard of it a long time ago? Okay. I think you probably attended one of my lectures back then. <laughs> well, in being here this evening, there are three things that I seek to achieve. Number one, to convey some information about an extraordinary event that took place in 1973 and that I personally feel the world deserves to know about. Number two, I want to, or at least I hope that the information I will convey to you will help you piece together this extraordinary puzzle that we all call quest for meaning. And lastly, I hope that uh, once I walk out of this room, no one will have believed in anything that I will present to you this evening. Because as you know, belief and understanding are two separate worlds. Primitive, superstitious people used to believe the earth was flat. But today we understand that it's round through science. In fact, we are a 100% scientific religion. That's a, a religion that has nothing to do with mysticism, supernatural, or the divine. I almost always like to start my presentations by saying that we should feel extremely privileged to be living in this day and age. For the first time in the history of our humanity, we can understand, thanks to our major biological breakthroughs, we can understand the what's, the why's, and the how's of life in a way that could never have been understood before, simply because science, the way we understand it today, didn't exist at the time. And so, since 1945, after the explosion of the atomic bomb over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, our humanity has entered a new era, a new age, the age of apocalypse, the predicted age of apocalypse, Apocalypse meaning revelation or understanding, or you can even call it the age of science. An age in which we have witnessed extraordinary breakthroughs, and in fact, the breakthroughs that we've witnessed are accumulating relentlessly today. And so the question is, really, how much of it can we really grasp and understand? For the past 58 years, since 1945, we've discovered atomic energies. We've uh, discovered DNA, of course. Uh, we've launched telecommunication satellites. Uh, we have um, DNA recombinant technology. Our first test tube baby in 1978, as you all know. Uh, we had the Human Genome Project in the early 90s. We had the cloning of a sheep in 1997, and where we are now today, cloning of a human being. A very controversial topic, one that we embrace 100%, because this is something that His Holiness Rael has been, I predicted would happen eventually. Are we ready for it? Probably not. but. As you know, 
nothing can really stop science. Religions have tried throughout our history unsuccessfully, thankfully. It's just a matter of, of allowing good people to use science for the benefit of humanity and making sure it doesn't fall in the wrong hands, such as governments, politicians, military, etc. So one thing, a parenthesis I want to say is uh, the Raelian movement is not out to recruit, convince, convert people. We're just here to convey information and then let you decide. Uh, personally, it took me seven years before I became part of it. First heard about it 21 years ago, as Abby was mentioning. And every Raelian on this planet, they have their own story to tell as to how or what attracted them to become part of it. When you actually can take a step back and look at the big picture and use your own logic, your experience, your intelligence and, and analyze information in a way that makes sense to you, however long it takes, I think the important thing is to try to understand and not just blindly believe because a lot of people think we're just people following a guy. We're not following anybody. We just analyzed the information and adapted it to the best of our intellectual ability. So seven years for me, other people, they read the book, they say, I've been thinking along those lines all my life. I'm ready, I want to help him accomplish his mission. Others, 10 years. Others, never. So we're not right here. I'm not here actually to try to convince you of anything. And I know some of you will probably ask me, well, do you have any evidence that Rail had a physical encounter? No, <laughs> I don't. And maybe it's better that way. Because nowadays with technology, anybody can fabricate pictures, anybody can fabricate videotapes. It would just add more, I think, to the skepticism. So best I can tell you, and before, in fact, anybody can intelligently agree or disagree with the book or the message, it's best to read the book make an opinion for yourself. This is what I did seven years after my own little research. I didn't want anybody to influence my decision. I'm very happy I did make that decision. Very happy to be a Raelian, very proud. I know there's a lot of bad things that I said about us in the media. What can you do? The media always seeks sensationalism. It's never changed. It will always be that way. But in the end, I think the, lo the, the love, the light, the truth shall survive, and uh, I'm uh, extremely happy again to be here this evening and share this information with you. So what happened in 1973? <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a nutshell uh, uh, piece of information before I present the videos. There'll be two short videos, maybe 10, 15 minutes each. Um, then I understand after an hour we'll just take a pause after it will be a, a videotape of an interview of his own in Israel and then I'll take, I'll be more than happy to try and answer your questions as best I can. In 1973 <coughs> a man by the name of Israel had a physical contact with a race of extraterrestrial human beings coming from another planet. These human beings call themselves the Elohim. They're in fact the Elohim of the Bible. Because if you understand a little bit about the Bible, the original was written in Hebrew, then translated in Greek, then Latin, and then all the other languages. And in the original Hebrew Bible, it doesn't say God. It says Elohim. Elohim is plural. It can be translated as those who came from the sky. These Elohim basically explained to Rael during that encounter that they came here a long time ago at a time when there was no life at all. And through their genius, I should say, through their highly technological advance and science, they performed experiments through the use of DNA and genetic engineering and scientifically created all life on this planet starting with plants, animals, and eventually human beings whom they created in their image. As the Bible, Genesis 126, 
let us create man in our own image. In fact, the Bible is an account, and not just in the Bible, you have that in every culture, traces of the presence of extraterrestrials who came here on this planet, mingled with humans, and eventually left, leaving us to progress by ourselves until the day we can understand who they are. And in fact, the goal of the Raelian movement is twofold. Inform people about this encounter and build an embassy in Jerusalem to welcome the Elohim back to the earth. And they will come back with all the prophets who started the major religions. Because in fact, all the prophets, whether Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, and all the prophets of old who started the major religions were people who were physically contacted by the Elohim to deliver a message adapted to the level of understanding at the time. As you know, for instance, Jesus, his message and Rael's message is not so different, except that 2,000 years ago, Jesus couldn't talk about DNA, he couldn't talk about genetics. He was dealing with fishermen. So there was no science at the time. And therefore Jesus, in order to make people believe in who he said he was, had to perform miracles. This was the only way because he couldn't talk science to these uh, fishermen. So Jesus' message was basically, believe in me. I'll do miracles, but believe in me. I'm the son of God. In effect, son of Elohim. And Raoul is here to demystify that concept, to demystify the notion of just believing, but rather to bring it in a way or give it a spin that will allow us to understand rather than believe. So, essentially, build this embassy in Jerusalem because right now there's too much violence on this planet. The Elohim cannot come. Obviously, they don't want to come here and take our free will and impose their presence on us. Rather, they tell us, build this embassy, and if you really want us to come, we will. So the embassy is, in a way, an invitation for them to come. And the request has been submitted to the Israeli government several times, and it's been rejected. I know the Egyptian government is interested in giving us the land, because we need land to, bis to build this embassy. It will be a piece of land that is internationally recognized as neutral territory. In other words, there will be no military. And in the same way, it will benefit from the rights that any embassy has around the world. American embassy, for instance, in Russia. Russian government cannot go inside. It's, it's totally, it has total immunity. So we will have an embassy for these beings coming from another planet. And when they will come, and I'm very confident and hopeful it will happen before we destroy ourselves, uh, they will come back and meet with our political leaders to speak with us, to share some of their knowledge with us, and also to make us benefit from their wisdom and technology. And in fact, in Rael's first book, The Message Given by Extraterrestrial, which I definitely encourage you to read, even if after reading it, you say, oh, after all, this is a great science fiction book. It doesn't really matter. At least when the Elohim come one day, you'll know that we're talking about a peaceful race of human beings. So in the second part of this book, there's a chapter called The Keys, in which the Elohim are giving us very powerful tools uh, to help us make it as a humanity. Because you have to keep in mind that the Elohim, despite their high level of advancements. They're 25,000 years more scientifically advanced than we are. Uh, they've gone through what we are going through right now. And so who better to, in a way, tell how a watch works than the watchmaker, if you will. Uh, they've gone through, so they give us tools and, and little hints as to how we can make it as humanity. And of course, we have revolutionary values. Not so revolutionary, I would say, maybe on the scientific side, but hey, who is not for world peace today? Who is not for nonviolence? Who is not for sharing inequality? Who is not for 
uh, democracy, who is not for a world government. You know, and those I think are slowly, wow, distilling into our society, diffusing in a way, because there's really no other way for our humanity to make it if it's not going to be through love. You know, and, and I'm a firm believer that there's good in every people, in every person on this planet. Uh, it's just that, unfortunately, <clears throat> there's a lot of stupid wars, you know, for religious reasons. But if the rally movement really, in effect, is here to spiritualize science, in other words, demystify it, and also to bring more science into religion. So, and we're here also to bring all the religions together, because the word religion comes from the Latin religare, which means to create a link, to link people together, to link people with the Creator, to link Earth and the stars. It's, it's all about linking. We're not a, a religion that tries to separate itself from everybody else, because there's a bit of truth in every religion, as you know. We're just here to, hey, show you this is the end product of the puzzle. You look at it and you decide. That's as simple as this. And so, wow, well, I think I've talked enough. Maybe we could start by presenting a video. The first clip is a very, it's not a video that has rallyings in, it's not made by the rally movement, but it's one that I find very interesting in that it en encapsulates what mainstream science and religion starts to grapple more with, and that is that there are extraterrestrials, there is life on other planets, that there is no evidence that the theory of evolution is what in fact happened. Because I want to add that we are here to bring a third explanation for the genesis of life on this planet. As you know, there is the God theory, and there is uh, evolution theory through Darwinism. And what we're saying is that there's a race of intelligent beings who deliberately, not by accident, just deliberately came here and scientifically engineered all life on this planet. So, <clears throat> we, this video again is, there's some scientists speaking and they're really trying to convey this kind of universal knowledge that we're not alone anymore and I'm sorry if some of you thought we were but uh, the universe is too huge, it's too big for us to even claim that we're alone. There was a time when we thought we were the center of the universe but we're no longer the center of the universe because the universe has an infinite number of galaxies and therefore an infinite number of uh, inhabited planets. And the second video is actually a clip of what our organization is all about. So it's a nutshell presentation of uh, what I've just explained to you. And then after that, I guess I'll conclude uh, before the break, and then we'll show the interview of His Own Israel, and then I'll take questions. So thank you very much for your uh, patience, and thank you for your attendance. I really appreciate you being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I want to stress that no one in this organization is more important than the message. Not me or any other Raelian on this planet, not even Rael, not even the Elohim, who could easily have kept this message to themselves. After all, they had every reason to. They had every reason to say this creation was a mistake when they saw all the violence. But instead, they're kind of very hopeful that we're going to make it as a humanity. And so they decided throughout our history to send different messengers and share the message of love and peace of the Elohim, the message of the Genesis. And Rael is here, alive today. And I consciously, with all my heart, decided to follow him because the message that he brings vibrates with me. And as you know, it's always easier to follow a dead prophet than one that's alive. In my 14 years as a Raelian, I've encountered some extraordinary people. A lot of them saying, you know, Felix, if I, have li if I had lived in the days of Jesus or Buddha 
or Joseph Smith, no matter what the religion is, I would have been in his life. I would have been helping him accomplish his mission, spread the message. It's always, and my response is, it's always easier to say because now they're gone, you see. But Rel is here. He announces himself as the last of a lineage of 40 prophets. And he's still alive today, and he's still spreading this message. But as you know, how can you tell? There's so many false prophets running around. How can you tell a true from a false prophet? Well, obviously, if a guy came up to you and said, hey, give me all your assets and all your money, and then commit suicide, you know that he's bogus. <laughs> but can uh, someone make an awful lot of sense in his revelations and still be considered a lunatic? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. And this is the case with Rael. But having said that, there is an old test that can tell the difference between a true and a false prophet. It's called the biblical test of a prophet. Uh, the problem with it is that it requires one to wait and see if the things that he says happen or not. If they do, then he's a true prophet. If they don't, he's a false prophet. The problem is that if you wait and see for, for the things to happen, it's always too late to react. In other words, it won't matter whether he's a true or false prophet, because one can only benefit from, from what a prophet reveals by reacting to what he's saying at the proper time. Now, as you and I both know, one person's prophet will always be another person's false prophet. In other words, there will always be people who cry false prophet and who accuse him of making up his message to make money. They did it with Buddha. They did it with Jesus. They did it with Muhammad. And the funniest thing is that these were people who cry false prophet would most likely kill or imprison the prophet of their own religion if he was to appear on the street today and say, hey, I'm your prophet. So what exactly does it take to make that distinction? I think it, a lot of it has to do with your own experience. A lot of it has to do with your own logic. A lot of it has to do with your own intelligence. And soon enough, you'll realize that a true prophet will never use or endorse violence to spread his message. Whereas a false prophet will use any means necessary. Uh, a false prophet will also tell you never to question what he's saying. Otherwise, if you do, you'll never become enlightened. Whereas a true prophet will always tell you to never cease questioning what he's saying. And this is what Rael has been doing for the past 30 years. He doesn't want us to believe in him. He wants us to try to understand. We don't want to make the same mistake as people did in the days of Jesus when Jesus pointed his finger to the horizon and everybody stared at his finger. Uh, this is not what Rael wants. He's not important, he's just a messenger. He's just delivering a message. You do with it whatever you want. I'm here to share it with you. I'm very, very happy to be here to share it with you. I know you're gonna walk out of here. Some of you will have some food for thought. Others will be skeptical and it's fine. I totally respect that, you know, because we all have different backgrounds. Like I said, it took me seven years. You know, I wasn't ready, I guess, because you really have to be ready. And this goes to show that, you, you know, we're only about 60,000 people since 1973, which is not very many. And again, it's evidence that you definitely have to be a free thinker to be part of it. Because for most people, after reading the book, this is not something they'll agree with and understand right away, although there is a small percentage of people who have re reacted that way because they were ready. But if you're not ready, you're not ready, and that's the bottom line. Essentially, when the Elohim come one day, at least, again, you'll know we're talking about a peaceful race of human beings who came here a long time ago, and all they wish is for us you know, to be happy. This is the essence of the teachings of Rael, for human beings to be happy, for us to share love, but you can't share love unless you love yourself. So there's a lot of techniques, there's a lot of workshops that Rael teaches, has been teaching around the world. And uh, one of them is central meditation. And it's essentially a technique of meditation that has to do with the senses. So by awakening your body, you can awaken your mind and vice versa. And it's a technique that teaches that there's no division. You know, for thousands of years, religions have said mental and physical are separate. 
they don't go together. We're here to say they do come together as one. No division. This is uh, a way to avoid creating all these physiological imbalances, as you know. If you create a separation, if you dissociate yourself from pleasures, because sensual meditation is a way to attain high levels of consciousness by allowing your environment to give you pleasure. Because the only way you can perceive your, your environment is through your senses. So by sharpening your senses, by becoming more sensitive to your environment, whether it's watching a sunset, whether it's, I don't know, hugging a tree, whatever it is, if, if you subject yourself to an environment that doesn't bring you pleasure, it's almost like being masochistic. Then you should be somewhere else, do something else. Because it's only through pleasure that you can awaken your mind and at the same time awaken your body. So I will take a first round, we have 10 minutes, a first round of questions before the break. Then after the break, we'll show the interview of Rael and I'll take a second round of questions then. So I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Yes. Two parts in your question. <clears throat> the Elohim have explained that the universe was infinite, meaning that there's an infinity of planets on which there's life. So in this part of the universe, whatever this part means, the earth is like their garden. In other words, they wouldn't allow another extraterrestrial to come here and tamper with us without their consent. That's the uh, Number one. As far as abductions, <clears throat> there's two elements that I want to mention with respect to abductions. Number one, the Raelian movement does not believe in abductions. The Elohim are telling us that there's a cosmic law, you know, a, a law at the cosmic level which says that any time a civilization has developed technologies enabling them to travel in space. It also means that they've discovered ir irreversible powers that can destroy them. And if you don't use this power for the benefit of humanity, you self-destruct. So in other words, any time a civilization is able to travel in space and go search for extra uh, for planetary life uh, on other planets, it also means that they're peaceful, that they're nonviolent. And so, the Elohim have explained to Rael that the abductions, they would not allow that to happen. They would not allow an extraterrestrial race to come and tamper with us. The second part is what I've been reading. Um, there's some research that has been done about this topic and some neuroscientists have found out that there is, uh, they've studied uh, on subjects who claim to have been abducted and they've uh, noticed that there's an, a hyperactivity in the temporal lobes and uh, the temporal lobes is an area where oftentimes we have uh, sleep paralysis or false awakenings, or sensations of levitating or falling, etc. Of course, this research is in its infancy, so we don't really have all the answers. Uh, but I'm sure that with time, a lot will be revealed. And thirdly, I want to say, um, there's a lot that the government does that we don't know. You know, and uh, the CIA, I'm sure, is involved in a lot of things. In fact, you, you well know that there's been a, a cover-up, a UFO cover-up since the Roswell incident. The government has been very reluctant in releasing information to the public, and they still are to this day. So I'm sure at one point we will know a lot more uh, with respect to whether or not these abductions are done by the government or otherwise. Why would the geneticists create such magnificent, beautiful light and 
then have it kill each other to live. They were not very happy with their creation. You're talking, when you said geneticists, you mean the Elohim? Yeah. The extraterrestrials? Because the life on Earth that they created is absolutely magnificent. You would think they would have created another way for them to exist and procreate. That would be non-violent. Um, they could have, of course, because the free will has always been a strong element uh, with respect to the creation of humanity. It, it, the problem is that if you don't teach a child the proper ways in life, then the likelihood of this child being influenced by an environment, especially if it grows in a violent environment, is likely to produce a violent child. So early in the creation of life on this planet, the Elohim were very displeased because we were killing one another, essentially. You know? And this is the reason. Who is killing one another? Well, very primitive people, tribes against each other. Uh, oh, I see. So the Earth was already inhabited with tribes? No, they created human beings. Oh. OK, they created humans, the first humans. And then over time, these humans were, didn't have any scientific knowledge. You know well, what's... I'm talking about why a tiger would want to kill a deer. It's in the genetic code. It's, it's called, it's in the very early stages of the creation of life, you had to instill some mechanisms that would allow them to survive. You know, it's a sur survival kind of mechanism. But my point is, if they were so brilliant, such masterful artists, mm -hmm. why wouldn't they create animals that would live off air? or just the energy of Well, this is how it works on their planet. When they created life on this planet, they were just trying to reproduce or recreate the way they were created themselves, you see? So they started with very simple experiments, plants, animals, and eventually they decided to create humans like themselves. So originally it was just an experiment. And as a scientist, when you do perform an experiment, you really know, don't know full well how it's going to go. It can go good or it can go bad. If it goes bad, the first instinct you want to do is to stop it before it gets worse, you see? And if it goes well, then it's a, it's a success. So for a long time, it was a successful creation. But it's, it's in allowing these humans, giving them their free will, and not really telling them how things work in a way, Letting, letting them make their own choices. It wasn't always the best choices, even today. We're still, but we're still very uh, violent. Uh, if, if you were their creations, they could have come at the early stages and they could have interfered and make some adjustment in the DNA code so that their violence will, will not be so um, prevalent. They could have done a lot of things. So they could so have. So then, how can. Uh, then, then they obviously they are not perfect, so, uh, but, so, but they, sh they should have seen what's going on, why did they, they choose to correct their mistakes, this is their choice. Right? Well, they didn't create biological robots, they just create human beings, you know, and, and if they had to come every time and, and modify something in the genetic code, it's not, it's, it takes away everything from, you know, the free will aspect. So you got to let them evolve, you got to let them progress, you got to let, let them learn from their mistakes. But it's said in the film that they created all the life on Earth mm -hmm. from their laboratory. Yes. So you have to understand that the technology of the Elohim evolved. In other words, they started with very simple you know, organisms and then multicellular organisms and then plants, and as their technology evolved, a lot of artists also were involved in the creation, so they had to, they could interject their art. This is why we see so much beauty in the creation. And all this beauty that we see around us was created for us to enjoy, not destroy. Yes? Um, yeah, a couple things. Uh, when you're um, talking about the creation of the Elohim, mm -hmm. and you're talking about something Belief in, in a, uh, a creator or some such 
And the other thing is, uh, it's a personal opinion. Uh, I think one of the reasons why people go out and endeavor to create gods is because uh, they're afraid of adult responsibility. They don't want to grow up, so they create uh, perhaps the nurturing god or goddess, or, or god the father, the strict disciplinary. There's a tendency to do this. There's a, a break that happens with a teenager where you get up and you go out and you go out into the world. But yet in you, there is that desire and need for the, the loving but strict father, the nurturing mother, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that question I have for you is what you say that it's scientific and it doesn't have to do with superstition, yet there's a religion and high priests, which I find interesting that topic. But the question is, what um, what is your religion slash philosophy's concept of science? How do you, how, in other words, you say it's scientific. What do you mean by science? Or what does it mean by science? Because you'll get a lot of different opinions as to what science is. I'd <coughs> like to know what yours is. Science, science is love. I mean, this is pretty deep, but if you, it's, it's the technology that will, it's the engine that will propel this humanity into the golden age. In other words, we're already in the third millennium. Uh, the problem is that we are in the third millennium, scientifically and technologically, but with a brain that still functions in the medieval times, okay? And so, the idea is really, when I say spiritualized science, I want to say to bring, put all our brains together, humanity, and allow all of this humanity to benefit from science. Because science is not evil. Science is good. You know, science is, science is life. Science is, uh, without science, I think we would struggle. I'm not understanding how you're equating the word science and love. In other words, if you're talking about love, are you talking about love? And if so, if you're talking about science, how does that... How does that science is, is... I'm kind of playing devil's advocate. I understand. Okay. It's all the technologies that will... Ah, uh, technology... Is science a method and the technology something different? Science is the development of technologies, okay? In, in a sense, science is the development of technologies that will enable us to enter the golden age of civilizations. Okay, in other words, if we use science to our own benefit, we will be able to travel in space, we will be able to go and see the other planets, we will be able to make this world a peaceful world um, without any weapons. Um, so when I say science is love, it's the opposite of, of evil, you know, because if you misuse technologies, usually you increase your chances of self-destruction. You're talking about using science love. And science and technology love. Not, yes and no, but you know, when I say science is love, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than just using science in a loving way. It's eradicating these concepts uh, uh, greed, power, control, uh, suppressing populations in obscurantism. It's, it's helping others. Uh, it's, it's creating life. It's curing diseases. It's, it's all these things that can enable us eventually to become eternals. You, you can do that. That's already happening. <laughs> no, it's already happening because it's true that testosterone oftentimes leads to violence. Okay? Too much testosterone. Part of the teachings of Rael is the concept of femininity. The concept of femininity is a way or a, a, a concept that teaches men especially how to become more feminine because throughout the ages masculinity male power and etc has always been in charge if you will 
of making decisions for, the, for everybody else. But I'm convinced that if you let women govern this world, there'll be more peace. There's no question about it. I totally am. And, and so the concept of femininity is, is not to become gay for a man. You know what I mean? It's, it's to tap on in this inner side to enable us to eliminate all the barriers that exist between human beings. Yes? If I go back to this thing of origins, you said the Elohim came and found this planet and was suitable for, for mm -hmm. life. But then you also alluded to that, that there'd be other worlds and other they wouldn't allow others. So they're not the, the creators of all Correct. lives. Correct, this, yes. Of their world, Correct. where did they come from? Yes. And where did the other lives on these other planets that's a, they exist out yes. there? That's a, that's a good life. question. Because, see, if you believe in God, you still don't know who created God or how God came about. If you believe in Darwinism, you still don't know how the first cell came about. Right? But then all of a sudden, we have a third way which explains that these Elohim, these geniuses, we're able to prove that the universe was infinite, meaning there's no beginning, there's no end. Okay? This is what this symbol means. And infinity is a concept that's very difficult to comprehend because we're born one day and then we die, and so we assume that everything is finite. But if you take a, a step back and look at the big picture, everything is infinite. And so the Elohim explained that they were created by a more advanced race of people, which was created by a more advanced race of people, and it goes on and on ad infinitum. And the same thing is going to happen with us terrestrial humans, when our science evolves to the point where we can travel in space and search for another planet, we will become gods. We will create life. We've already created life on a small scale on this planet. But once we travel in space and find a planet suitable for the creation of life, we will create life. We will do exactly what they did. Eventually, we'll create humans. They will evolve, you know, until the day they reach the age of science, like we are in today. And they will start to understand. And we are just another link in the chain of the infinite cycle of creation throughout the universe, if you will. So the Elohim are related to these other groups as well, because they probably came from these other groups. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And you're saying that they, when the gentleman back here alluded to some of these other issues, you're saying that they would not allow that to happen. So some of these other groups, even though the relations could be like a family squabble, so to speak, I mean, I mean, yeah. is that kind of the idea? Uh, family squabble, there's no violence in space. Okay, well, 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 then why would they have to prevent that? You said they wouldn't allow that to happen. Well, well the, it doesn't have to, to be a violent intervention from another race. It, they say, they explain in the book, it's possible. It's possible that another extraterrestrial race may want to come here, but they wouldn't do it before going through them. That's what they explain. In the book. Oh, Raleigh is not the only one, you know, who's had a physical contact with extraterrestrials. It's happened throughout our history. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, personally, I don't. I never have. Uh, we're an atheist organization, but atheist doesn't mean you don't believe in, in the Creator. It simply means you don't believe in the concept of God, per se. So then your purpose of meditation is not ultimately to reach God, but to have an experience of euphoria and peace in order to um, create that in this world? And I will, I will answer. It, it is in a way to reach God. Yeah. However, we define God as infinity. So it's not, uh, in, uh, to make it comprehensible, you know, God is infinity. The Elohim believed in God at one point because they were where we are at today. You know, they didn't all of a sudden 
got created and uh, get created and then they were uh, like really super intelligent and everything. They had to go through a process. So they did at one time believe in evolution. They did at one time believe in a God. And then when they were able to prove that the universe was infinite, the notion of God is infinity. So when we meditate, that's what we're trying to connect with. Because infinity is not something you want to understand. It's something you want to feel. And the only way to feel infinity is through meditation. Do they have, excuse me? Do they allow for the possibility? Of course, of course. You know, we're not trying to tell people, okay, you're, you believe the wrong way, this is not what you should believe. The most, the very, the common denominator is happiness. If you're happy in what you believe in, then that's great, that's fantastic. Please, don't, don't do things, you know, to change that. What all we're trying to do is bring information and then you let it simmer, whatever you want to do, if, even if you don't even want to look at it, that's fine. But be happy, that's the most important, that's the message of the LIM. Well, I mean, if, if, when you say that, there's been people who've been uh, maniacs and killers in history who've been very happy. <laughs> 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 or, Hitler, you have, well, I mean, yeah. No, but... Uh, no, no, common sense, okay, is, is also something that you have to understand. Common sense means respecting life, respecting your own life and respecting everybody, other's life, you know. And this is, when you have a, an understanding of where you come from, okay, I think that it, it eliminates a lot of, of possibilities of, uh, of uh, you know, killing people of your own kind. It eliminates the possibilities of Holocaust. Um, these people, you know, they lacked love. <laughs> That's why they acted that way, obviously. So if you bring more love in this humanity, I think there's a stronger chance, no matter what your religion is. You know, and we're not the only ones that tries to make this planet a peaceful and loving planet. There are many other organizations. Yes? What's their motivation in creating another race? Why did they go to all that effort and expense over so many years? It's scientific curiosity. And it was just an experiment in the first uh, place. And this is the same again. This is the same thing that we're going to do ourselves. Because curiosity is something that maybe I think was ingrained in us. It was put in our genetic code. This is really what drives us to conquer. This is what drives us to, to propel ourselves in, 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 in a, an age where all of a sudden we can accomplish what our primitive people uh, ancestors call miracle. But there are no miracles per se, there are only differences in levels of technologies and understanding. Because if I go to certain parts of Africa and perform uh, CPR, you know, people will think of me as a god. If I resuscitate someone, they think of me as a god because I brought someone back to life, but they didn't really have the understanding that if you massage the heart a certain way, you can indeed bring someone back to life. So there are no miracles, and this is what I want to emphasize. There are only differences in levels of technology. Okay. Uh, the first one is, where are they from? What constellation or dimensions these are in? Do you know? Did the, they reveal that? They do reveal in the book that uh, their planet is in our galaxy, but not in our solar system. And their planet, they call it the planet of eternal life, what's commonly known as, or referred to as heaven in the Bible. And it's uh, what dimension? I don't know anything about other dimensions, but okay. from what they're saying, it's a three-dimensional uh, world. Okay. The other thing is that, uh, so uh, there is a communication dictation or channeling or uh, between them and, uh, how you say his name, Rael? Rael, yes. Rael. Is there a direct he, he communication? Had, Rael had two physical contacts with them mm -hmm. in 73 and 75, mm -hmm. and he had uh, other telepathic uh, contact or communications with the Elohim. Okay, and then the cloning business. <laughs> Before we get into the cloning, any other questions regarding this interview? Or, I think you had one, right? I was asking about how the Ravens see soul and reincarnation. Okay. <clears throat> As a Raelian, you try to define terms through their original meanings. The word soul comes from Latin anima, which means that which animates. And today in our 
scientific world we understand and we know that what animates us is our DNA, our genetic code. Uh, that's what that's called, it's called actually the molecule of life. So, as much as our primitive ancestors used to believe that after you die, an invisible force leaves your body and goes to heaven, today we understand through science that such concept is not really uh, applicable to our understanding because, first of all, in order for this energy to go somewhere, there would have to be a center or a place for it to go. But we know that when we die, uh, this energy just blends with the rest of the surrounding energies. What really is important to understand is the concept of reincarnation. We call it scientific resurrection. The Elohim explained that from the time you, can, you are conceived until the time you die, all the actions that you contribute to society, whether positive or negative, are recorded. And after you die, they check. If you've done more positive around you throughout your life, they give you eternal life on their planet. If you have been more or have done more harm uh, to people around you and have not spread love around you, from dust you come, back to dust you go. And this is exactly what's written in the Bible. Um, this might be a question more so for you. Um, in the beginning of the seminar, you mentioned about um, uh, recreating human, human life. And, and you also mentioned something about that we, you think that we should shift more of a feminine energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and recreating life and, and being able to do that, using our intelligence to create such things that could also be destructive rather than just creating things and using our intelligence to to focus on things that can only be used in a positive light. Uh, I don't understand why we would go that path. And if he supports that, it doesn't seem like he has said anything that would support that, because it seems he was saying things more like being, which is more of a Buddha way, just be. I mean, and, and in feminine energy, what, what women tend to do is we're more of the receivers. So going internally and more in a meditative state, just you know, receiving the energy, receiving the light, receiving the love that channels in, and then just sending it right back out there. I think, personally, it's more of the way of achieving enlightenment and achieving our ability to then let go of this physical realm and travel beyond to other dimensions. So I don't understand how he would. Does he support genetically engineering people and recreating us? Absolutely. We're 100% uh, pro-human cloning. <clears throat> and, and this is part of technology because we believe that human cloning is uh, a way for us, us to attain eternal life in the physical sense. And the reason being that on the planet of the Elohim, the reason why they call it the planet of, et of eternal life, is that they have the ability to live about a thousand years and then recreate themselves through cloning in a three-step process. Sample a cell before the person dies, recreate the clone and have the clone go through a process called accelerated growth process where you actually clone an adult directly. Once you have the adult, you transfer memory and personality from the pre-existing individual into the new clone and this is how you, you have access to eternal knowledge and eternal life. So, that could be used in a negative sense. Why would we even it's, always, it's always used in a negative sense if it's in the wrong hands. You know what I mean? No, of course not. Of course not. But there will have to be some regulations as to who is entitled to use this technology. And that is only for us to decide. The Elohim cannot come here and tell us, okay, this is how you're going to do things. They don't want to do that. They, they want us to make it. You know, they have a, a, a high level of confidence that we're going to make it, but it's all going to be dependent on how we make our decisions and who we let govern us. Because we actually are the ones who vote for our leaders, you know, so. Are there thousand-year-old people on Earth now? Not to my knowledge. Um, I'm looking for a scorecard, a sense of a source to understand the Elohim as individuals um, and their roles in history. Um, because the, the current sense that I have now is that we've not only been made, but we've been messed with. That there was something maybe unique or special or 
cool about what they did create is that it has drawn a lot of attention. And um, there seems to be some, you know, it's in, in looking at the myths that now with the research uh, becomes more a uh, reliable record of reality, you know, there seemed to have been a lot of um, competition, uh, uh, differences of opinion um, about um, what was happening here, where it's supposed to go, uh, different different agendas, and that we got we were in the middle, you know, pulled apart, you know, pulled one way or the other way, and so. I'm not sure that all of the pathology that we now have is really totally our own responsibility. Um, and so is there any um, Actually, detail on this? In the book, yes, there is. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the critical values of the Rallying Message, is the awareness of the responsibility of our actions. And so when you say we don't really bear all the responsibility, actually, I think we do. Because the Elohim, they have, I mean, the technology to make things change right at the snap of a finger. But they don't want to do that, like I explained. They, they know that we can make it as a humanity. We're not perfect, and the Elohim said they're not perfect. And no matter where we were at different times throughout our history, when they intervened, you know, to kind of, and again, this is the reason why they sent many prophets, to guide humanity along the path of maturity and wisdom. But unfortunately, each time a, me a messenger or a prophet was sent, it was killed, or he was killed, or she was killed, crucified, whatever. And what we did is we used their message for political games. Right. You know? The distortion. The distortion, exactly. And it, even Rael receives death threats, I mean, periodically, you know, today, because we're revolutionary. We're really disturbing people. We're, we're disturbing the status quo, you know? And people don't want to be disturbed, when, especially when they fi find their sleep comfortable. So I know a lot of upheaval is going to happen in this society before the Elohim come. The question is, how will we handle it? You know, but I, again, I'm a firm believer that peace will ultimately uh, prevail on this planet, definitely. And if the Elohim sense that we're about to destroy ourselves, they are going to come and save only the righteous people. That doesn't mean just rallians at all, you know, because there's good people in every religion, you know. There's good in everybody, exactly. So they'll come and save the righteous people and then let the evil ones destroy the whole planet. Yes, Abby? Um, one thing that I would love to, to hear more about is, you know, in, in our culture sometimes, like for instance, marriage, people work towards marriage and they don't really think beyond it. You know, it's like the big day comes and then what? And I'm, I'm curious to what the Raelian vision is, if the NBC is created and the Elohim come, what's, what's the vision for the future Earth once the Elohim are here? Are they going to be living amongst us? Are they going to be ruling over us? Or, you know, what's, what's the plan there? I think <clears throat> it will be the most beautiful day that humanity has ever lived. To finally meet your parents, there's, you know, imagine the biological child who has been ado uh, adopted and who is looking, searching for his biological parents, you know, that he has or she hasn't seen for 10, 20, 30 years. All of a sudden they meet. We're talking about 10,000 years of separation between the Elohim and us. This will be the, a grandiose day. It'll be a day where I think we can be sponsored by Kleenex because there'll be a lot of emotions that, on that day. <laughs> There's no doubt. I mean, just the thought of it, I mean, gives me like goosebumps, you know. Um, when they come, they will share a lot of things with us. But first, you have to realize, I mean, you have to really realize, uh, realize the magnitude of what you're asking. Because when they come, it means that this world will, will be a peaceful world. Can you imagine that from happening? Can you imagine it? This is, this is great, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? When, when the world is peaceful and when we want them to come, because you know what's so great is that they respect our choice to say no. Can they come if there's not peace? If you build an no, I don't think so. Peace, I don't think so. I don't think so. And that's my own personal opinion. But once they come, of course, a lot of answers will be, a lot of questions will be answered. I cannot uh, specifically detail the agenda that they'll have. Uh, they're not definitely not going to come and rule us. Of course not, because they could do that any time now. You know. If we 
the cheap piece when we need them to come back here for it? <laughs> we don't, well, you know, <laughs> that we're not necessarily, uh, we don't have an obligation to invite them. Right. Not at all, it's our choice. We could decide, like I said, we could decide not for them not to come, absolutely. It's our free will, it's our free choice. Uh, but I believe deep down that um, a good po portion of the population will want to know because a lot of people are asking these fundamental existential questions, you know, who created me, why am I here, what's my purpose on this planet? And all of a sudden when you understand the rallying message that your parents are in space somewhere and they're waiting for you mm -hmm. to say yes please come, you know, but of course they can't come now because we need to change ourselves, we need to humble ourselves, you know, to the fact that they exist, that we're not the most intelligent, etc. And then when we start changing this planet and the embassy is built, it's, all, it's written in the scriptures from many religions that there will be a time when all the prophets will return to this planet just to prove what they did a long time ago. Whether you're cr Christian, you know Christ will come back. Whether you're Buddhist, you know Buddha will come back. Whether you're Muslim, you know Muhammad will come back. It's all in their scriptures and that day will be the most fantastic day that humanity has ever lived. Well, the Elohim explained that <clears throat> in the message that they will come between now and 2035. As far as 2012, what's going to happen, I know, I don't, I'm not really familiar with other calendars, you know, and, and with respect to what they really mean, what certain dates really mean. If they're bound to come back in 2012, then that's fantastic. You know, I welcome them uh, to come sooner. But again, we will have to go through a lot of societal changes before any of that happens. Even if uh, all of a sudden tomorrow Isra uh, the Israeli government said, okay, here's the, the land to build the embassy, doesn't mean they're going to come next week or next month or next year because it will have again to be recognized as international neutral territory. In other words, other governments will have to agree as to the, the um, not the validity, but the legitimacy of, of, and sovereignty of that location. Thank you. How much time? The LM explained Jerusalem because for three reasons. Number one, it's the area where they originally built huge labs to create life on this planet, what's known as, as Jerusalem today. Uh, Jerusalem in Hebrew means city of peace. Of course, as we know, there's still a lot of turmoil and violence going on there, but you have to be optimistic. And number three, it's a great magnetic pole, magnetic pole of three great religions. Uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. That's the reason why Jerusalem. Uh, you used the term for uh, this holiness. And you said that you personally didn't believe in God in a normal sense of love. To my mind, I've always equated holiness with godliness or akin to the closest to godliness. In what sense do you use the word as holiness? In the same way that you use uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, he's a spirit, Rel is a spiritual leader and that's how he wants to be looked at, not as a divine or supernatural being, just as a spiritual leader. And I think the, the term holiness was really to put the emphasis on journalists because over the years a lot of them have lacked respect uh, for what he's seeking to bring to this humanity and I believe that he's entitled to the same level of respect as the Pope or the Dalai Lama or any other spiritual leader. Yeah, um, if I have the impression that the Raelian movement basically seems a reductionist materialist movement. Everything evolves from matter. You don't have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You have the DNA, the RNA, and the Holy Enzyme. My interest in this, because I see this as fairly primitive science, that in my own opinion, the data on parapsychology is indicated conclusively, I mean as conclusively as you can, through good double-blind studies, that all of us have capacities such as telepathy, precognition, um, clairvoyance and remote viewing, which indicates that consciousness can go beyond time and space. <coughs> it doesn't just seem an epiphenomenon of brain or an epiphenomenon. There's a lot that the Elohim will answer once they come. I don't have all the answers. All I encourage you to do is to read the book. It will actually show you 
that we're not a reductionist uh, uh, organization at all. Um, <clears throat> consciousness is, is really the key element here. You talk as if, you know, DNA, RNA, uh, enzymes, etc. Uh, there's more to it than just this matter, this energy uh, also attached to it, but there's also consciousness. If it wasn't for the Elohim to interject consciousness into what they were doing, we probably wouldn't <laughs> be here today. But in the same way, when I go in the lab to perform an experience, I can't just sit and let things happen. I have to mix ingredients, make a reaction happen, and ultimately, you know, find a cure for cancer, for instance. But I had to interject some of my consciousness, some of my intelligence, and, and uh, design a protocol the way they did when they came here to create life. But of course, there's more to it. It's, it there's more to it than just the creation, you know, and, and the Elohim really explained that uh, when the technique of sensual meditation, again, I go back to this very powerful technique because it's, it's a tangible technique that teaches how you can raise your level of consciousness. You know, it's not just in this physical body and it's not just cellular, it's mental, it's clairvoyant, it's, 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 it's psychic. You know, if you will, there's, it, there's a sixth sense involved, extrasensory perception. This is what this technique tries to have, of, have us develop, not just the, the five common senses that uh, we are used to. Which country did Rayo have the ET contact? Did the Elohim teach this meditation to Rayo? And if they did, what can you go through a learning process to, to learn this meditation? Is there a class? Yes, absolutely. We teach medita central meditation throughout the world. It, it is indeed a technique that was taught to Rael by the Elohim. And every month, once a month, I have a gathering in the Bay Area, you know, to teach meditation. Uh, it's pretty much happening wherever there's someone, a Raelian, uh, local. Uh, usually they have that in their agenda to teach this meditation, which is uh, is definitely a, a powerful technique when you learn how to connect with infinity. That's very powerful. But uh, there's a book here. There are tapes on it just to give you an idea of what, what is said during this meditation. It's a guided meditation and, and develop the awareness of what composes us and what we are part of. This is what's really uh, powerful about it. Yes? Most people align with the God energy to find a Would you say that aligning with the Elohim in the way that you believe would provide protection in your life? You know, uh, in guidance, basically. I think that the guidance, in a way, the Elohim are somehow involved in guiding this humanity. I, I do believe that. As far as protection, you know, every time I fly, I hope they protect me because, you know, I don't want to go. I have too much uh, or too important a mission to accomplish before me to leave. But I do feel uh, oftentimes uh, that I am protected. So they're watching over, basically. I think they are watching. I think they can intervene in, in some areas more than others. But again, uh, Rael made it clear that the only time the Elohim will intervene before they officially come is to delay any action that would ultimately lead to the destruction of the entire planet. Do you think they communicate to you through coincidences and vision? Because I find random coincidences through my life that are mind blowing at times. I don't know really if I believe in coincidences. I, I've always believed that things happen for a reason somehow. And if we don't have the answer, we will ultimately find the answer as to what makes things happen in such a way that we are, you know, involved in, in those things. What makes us who we are is, is a series of events that I believe have not really happened by accident. It's also by choice, of course, but because we're not perfect, uh, we, we, we are entitled to make the wrong choices at times, other times we make the good choices, but if you believe in a way that you have some guidance from above, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to accept that also. Yes. One more. Well, I've always wondered, I mean, just recently I heard an interview, because it was Beckman's Day, and a gentleman was sharing about how everybody in his unit was, was wiped out except for him. And this was proof that, that God had protected him and uh, how blessed he was and lucky. In my mind, I said, well, what about the rest of the unit? What about the, what about the other people? 
And I've never found that satisfactory. I mean, that religion has never satisfied me with that. I mean, it really is, you know, and it's distasteful. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't go with that. You know, I tell other vets that's, you know, that, you know, that's, that, I, you know, what about everybody else? You know, and so this idea of protection. I mean, you know, they're going to protect you when you fly, but you know, what about somebody else? You know, so well, I'm very uncomfortable about this God protection thing. But I'm okay. You, you're entitled to, and I'm not saying for sure that that's what happens. This is what I want. I'm just looking for an answer. This is what I want to believe. <laughs> this is what I want to believe. You know, okay. and it makes me feel good just to think about it. But to say that it really is happening is totally beyond my my ability to understand and comprehend. You know, but I definitely understand what you're saying. But the Elohim, you have to understand that you have to understand that the Elohim love everybody on this planet. I mean, they don't discriminate this or the, that. They love just everybody because we're all their creation. You know. I don't fear death. I don't fear leaving this body. I don't fear. And that's great. Whatever's beyond this. And that's great because the, El the Elohim's teachings is, is also to accept death, you know, and not fear death, because life is just the continuation of death. And death is the continuation of life, you know. So it's it's it comes together. There's no separation. But I know a lot of people are afraid to die. But it's there's no reason to be afraid to die. I think. The word belief, and that was I used that that you said I believe, which was very interesting. Uh, what mechanism do you use uh, to prove to yourself that what he was told are in fact lies? Do you, do you use scientific deductive reasoning, or do you use uh, something more metaphysical, like intuition? Uh, a bit of both, but let me just elaborate a little bit. If Rael came tomorrow and said none of this was true, to me it may, makes more sense, still. It makes more sense. If anybody came to me and brought me another explanation for the genesis of life on this planet that I could comprehend and that I would think makes more sense than the Raelian message, I would probably go for it. You understand? And so I don't have any evidence that he had the encounter, like I said earlier. Nobody does. Where was the encounter? In France. In France. Nobody does have the evidence. And because what happens is the Raelian message, you understand it for what it is, really understand it. And then you can believe in it. But understanding has to come first. I don't know if you see where I'm going. Well, understanding, uh, are you talking about understanding intuitively or un understanding Well, un you understand intuitively as far as who Rael says he is. As far as scientifically, we are getting there. We've all, you know, since the discovery of DNA by Crick and Watson, we've made extraordinary breakthroughs in the biological science fields. And, and what Rael has been talking about since 74, human cloning, is actually happening today. So you're asking me, how do I test a prophet? Usually a true prophet is someone who prophesies that things are gonna, certain things are going to happen. And along the path of our scientific breakthroughs and discoveries are a lot of things that Rael have, has predicted would happen. You see? So human cloning right now is going to be evidence that we can create life in laboratory. And if we can't do it here on this planet, by the time our space travel program, program gets to where it should be, we will travel in space and go create life on another planet. So I think it's it for tonight. I really thank you for... Thank you. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer-operated federal 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. Material and monetary contributions are fully tax deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.